877-3DP show. He's a Hall of Famer. He's Al Michaels, Thursday Night Football, play-by-play on Amazon. Al, great to see you again. How's morale? I'm so happy to uh, fill this window of opportunity for you. <laughs> <laughs> As always, it's so funny. You mentioned Bob Uecker, and I know when you uh, promoted the fact that I was going to be on the show, you called me Albino. Uh, but that was the name Dennis Miller gave to me. I much prefer Alfalfa, <laughs> which is the name Bob Uecker gave to me in 1982 and was stolen by Howard Cosell. God, you go back to Euchre and the Miller Lite commercials and how the, when he was on with Johnny Carson and like he was killing it when he was on with Carson. I think Johnny Carson actually said at one point, maybe he wrote about it in, in a book that I, he put Euchre, I think, in the top five of the people he loved to interview. I think Don Rickles would be in there, too. I mean, Don Rickles is clearly the funniest man I have ever met. And Bob Euchre, I mean, he's right in that pantheon. I mean, Euchre would come. I, you know, I think I've told you this story before, but I was doing a game with Euchre and Cosell in uh, the early 80s. And, you know, Howard wanted a bunt in a situation where you'd never bunt. And Euchre's trying to talk him off of it, but, you know, very softly and kindly. And now uh, Howard's going to play with him again. And he says, all right, Euchre, you don't have to be so truculent. You do know what truculent means, don't you? And without hesitation, Euchre says, Howard, of course, if you had a truck and I borrowed it, it would be a truculent. <laughs> and I mean, not only was Euchre funny, but Euchre was quick. He was, uh, you know, somebody would say something and a second later, bango. I love that he said, you know, catching a knuckleball is easy. You just wait till it stops rolling. <laughs> right. Uh, and also, I mean, he has so many great lines. You know, uh, there was a $5,000 bonus uh, that was offered when he signed. He said, well, my father couldn't afford that much. <laughs> so <laughs> I love Bob. I just love the guy. Did you ever meet Johnny Carson? I met him very briefly at a restaurant. I was never on his show. No. Uh, would have loved it at that point. But uh, I know that, you know, our, our good buddy, Bob Costas, one of his, uh, the things that he wanted to do before his career was over to get on the Carson show. And I think he did that last week, but no, I just met him once in a restaurant. End of story. All right. Let me set up the premise because we thought of you the most greatest player in sports history. So we, we created, you know, a new phrase here, the most greatest players. Cause we were talking about Wayne Gretzky. You know, when you look at dominance in your sport, eight heart trophies. Um, I mean, what he did is, is Ruthian in his sport. But if you were going to give me your top five most greatest players in sports history, no, you know, depending on whatever sport you want to pick. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, ESPN at the end of the 20th century, 1999, they did the 30 for 30 and they picked the top 100 athletes of the 20th century. And um, I was on a panel, and I had to pick them one through 100. It was hard because, you know, there were so many. I actually went with Jim Thorpe because no, there was no television, start of the century, uh, multiple Olympic medalists, gold medalists, played professional baseball, played professional football. But, you know, pre-television age, radio was still in its infancy. But you're right about Now, you mentioned the, the two people who I thought about, two, Babe Ruth, who, of course, would, you know, one year, I think 1921, he had 59 home runs to lead the league. The next guy hit something like 24. So it was, you know, pretty much like Gretzky. Wayne was the same way. You know, Wayne would lead the lead in goals by a margin of two and a half to one. So I put, you know, Wayne in there, Ruth, certainly. Now you get to basketball and so many, you know, I, look, I go back when I'm in high school, I saw Elgin Baylor play. Elgin Baylor was Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan. Because the game was played so differently at that point. So you had Michael, I love, you know, living in LA, I saw a ton of Kobe. And I mean, I got to put Kobe right up there next to Michael. Uh, you can argue that till, you know, till your death as to who was the better guy. Everybody, for the most part, would say Michael, but they were both off the charts fantastic. I think for football, there were so many great quarterbacks. But I, for my football player, Believe it or not, I, I put in uh, Jerry Rice because Rice did that same thing to the record book that Gretzky and Ruth did. Mm -hmm. He was so much better than everybody at that particular time. And uh, as while we're on the subject of Gretzky, 
I have to say something to you, Dan, because, you know, a lot of people obviously don't follow hockey, but as a hockey maniac, Connor McDavid of the Edmonton Oilers, without question, the best player I've seen since Wayne. And I know it's heresy to say, is he better than Wayne? Wow. But I ran into Grant Fuhrer, who was the goalie on those Edmonton teams in the 80s. So he would know. And I said to Grant, I said, Grant, I said, it's heresy. Is McDavid better than Gretzky? He had a great answer. He said, not yet. Oh, wow. He said, he said, Wayne made everybody around him better. But McDavid is, I, I love, you know, I, I watch Edmonton like, um, you know, on the NHL uh, plus net, whatever it is network just to see uh, him play anyway so there you would have me and then if you're only talking about teams you know you're eliminating like boxers i think muhammad ali actually won that thing by the way if i if a memory serves no jordan won it did jordan win it and where, where did ali finish he had to finish in the top three or so i i, would I think secretariat was up there wow <laughs> yes and I all, forgot that. all people were so upset because I hosted that. I each week yeah. I'd reveal, you know, who was right. number seventeen. And I remember when we revealed that Secretariat was one of the top fifty athletes of all time. <laughs> oh, people went through the roof. Paulie, you have the top five. Yeah, the top five uh, ESPN's greatest North American athletes: Michael Jordan, Babe Ruth, Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, Wayne Gretzky. Then it goes to Jesse Owens, Jim Thorpe, etc. I would put Jackie Robinson there. I think Jackie is the greatest athlete of all time for this reason. I, I'm going to add importance there. What he went through to do what he was doing. Baseball wasn't his best sport. He could have played football. He played football at, at UCLA, ran track. So he was also a basketball player at UCLA. So if I look at all four sports that he might have been able to play professionally, and by the way, you played in baseball, you broke the color barrier, you had teammates who didn't even want you on the field at that time, and you became a Hall of Famer. Yeah, I mean, again, there's no question as to the importance of Jackie Robinson and what he meant. Um, but again, you go into this uh, barroom argument. And by yeah. the way, why is it, why is it called the barroom? You ever say we want to meet you in the barroom, right? <laughs> we want to meet you in the bar, right? Yeah, I always love that phrase, barroom argument. And um, it's a barroom brawl. It's a bar. It's a barroom brawl, right? Yes. It's never a bar brawl. Yeah. Where did that start? Yeah. I mean, in terms of significance and what he's meant to sports and what he meant to you know sports intertwined with society and, and and a lot of everything else. You know, Robinson is there, but then again, you know, somebody's got to be number one. So pick your number one. And you know, uh, Jordan's a good answer. Yeah, I remember we were trying to get him to do an interview. And this is right up to the very end. We're trying to get Jordan to sit down and do an interview. They want to put together his, his moment. And Mike didn't want to do it. And I remember at the time, Tim Duncan was playing in the NBA Finals. And he wanted to know who was going to be the number one person. He gets mm -hmm. done. He just beat the Knicks. He comes into the interview room. Because I said, look, if you win the NBA title, I'll tell you. He gets, he just won the title. He walks in, he goes, who's number one? And I go, well, you guys are. He goes, no, who's number one? And I said, Michael Jordan. And then he goes, okay. Like that, yeah. for some reason, yeah. he really wanted to know. But I, I, you know, Mike doesn't like reflecting back. Um, he doesn't do a lot of these interviews. I mean, he did the last dance. And I think the last dance felt like it was a, a reminder to those who think, LeBron or Kobe, these other modern day players are on his level. I think that's part of the reason why he did that documentary. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, th I think he knew at that point because, I mean, nobody really knew that they were doing that. And they, their behind the scenes footage uh, and the audio was you, you, you watched it and went, wow, where'd they get that? How'd they do that? So he, he knew what he had in mind for maybe his legacy, but you're right. He did, uh, he did very few interviews as did Co Kobe. Kobe didn't do that many interviews either during that period of time. Well, so they were very selective. He said, Michael was the hall of famer. Do you remember your first NFL game that you called? I certainly do. So I'm doing the Cincinnati Reds during the baseball season. And then NBC called me in 1971, <clears throat> my first year at Cincinnati. 
and said, can you do a regional NFL game on October 3rd, 1971? We want you to go to Minnesota and do Buffalo against Minnesota. And, and, and in those years, the, the home team was blacked out. So it wasn't even shown in Minneapolis. It only went to Buffalo. It's during the baseball playoffs, which was why I got the job as Kurt Gowdy and Jim Simpson were doing the playoffs that, that year. So every, Jay Randolph moved to number one, and I came in to do the last game. So not only does it only go to Buffalo, it doesn't even go to the regular NBC station. It goes to a UHF station oh, wow. in Buffalo. So Minnesota wins the game 19 to nothing. Uh, Bud Grant was the coach. And in that game... O.J. Simpson was the running back, and Al Cowlings was the defensive lineman in that game. You can look it up. Yeah. So that's how I broke in. And then uh, two weeks later, I did the Buffalo at the Jets at Shea Stadium, same kind of thing. New York is blacked out. It's during the baseball postseason. So I go all the way back to, uh, to 1971 doing my first NFL game. Toughest sport, or how about the easiest sport to do play-by-play in? The easiest? <clears throat> well, I built my career around baseball, so it was so comfortable. And it's a different it's a different sport to do, obviously. You have some time, it's more relaxing and all, all you know. So I mean baseball was easy for me. And then a ton of football, you know, I've done nine hundred NFL games now and probably a couple hundred college games. So, you know, I, I, I get how to do football. Uh hockey is the hardest. Without question, hockey on radio is the hardest because if you're in your car, you can picture a baseball game. This team's at bat. This team's in the field. In football, this team has the ball. This team is on defense. In basketball, even though there's a lot of turnovers, you know who has the ball. In hockey, the change of possession is so quick and so rapid. And people, you know, you don't get to see, like, if, you have, if you're a fan of the Rangers, but they're playing Winnipeg. You know, you, you know who your guys are. You have no idea who the other guys are. So I think, you know, guys who do hockey on radio uh, very well have a great deal of respect for me because I think it's the toughest. How's your eyesight? My eyesight is pretty, pretty good. I wear a daily contact lens in my right eye. But you have to have um, good eyesight to, to do play-by-play, -play, don't you? You do. Oh, for sure. Um, but again... These days, the coverage is so great that I think very often you're calling the game off the monitor because you can see the game a lot better off the monitor than you can if you're sitting, you know, high up. I mean, some of the uh, broadcast vantage points are great, like Kansas City, uh, even New York. You're kind of like right over the field and you feel like you're right there. And then you get to other places where you're like in the top of the upper deck. I remember Candlestick Park when the 49ers played there. The football broadcast booth was so high. I once <laughs> said I couldn't resist my. I said, We're, you're actually looking down on the blimp. I mean, it was ridiculous. <laughs> so you had to call the game off the monitor in, in, in those years. You know, I, I try to, you try to do it both ways. I try to, you know, watch how they're lined up with my na naked eye, see how the play begins. Then you go to the monitor because you're going to see it a lot better off the monitor. Yeah, I I always admired what Doc Emmerich did to to tremendous, but to do it on TV where it's so fast paced, but you don't have to describe all the action because you want to be fair to the audience that you don't say everything that you see. But when it right. comes to radio, and that's the tricky part of you can see it. I don't have to say it, but what am I going to say to kind of complement what you're watching? How difficult was that for you at any time? Yeah, well, I, you know, I didn't do that much hockey, but you know, <laughs> well, any do. any sport though, like you're, right. you, we get to see, and you you assume your audience is knowledgeable, and then how much do you tell them what they're actually seeing? Well, first of all, I mean, there's there's a difference between announcing a football game on television and on radio. On radio, you need to use every verb; nobody can see anything. Mm -hmm. On television, I talk about very often using captions and ellipses you see the play you don't have to necessarily use the verb because the verb becomes a visual to the fan so uh in football and base same thing basically in baseball um 
and roughly the same in basketball. Hockey is a different animal because in hockey, you know, and Doc Emmerich had it down perfectly. He almost did a radio call on television. Not exactly, but, you know, you want to keep up with the pace. The pace of the game is so fast yeah. and back and forth and change of possession, almost scoring. So it's pretty, the ho hockey would be the closest to combining radio and television. The other sports are vastly different. Would you rather be great or entertaining? Well, I think um, I think they go hand in hand, Dan. Well, I really let, do. let's say you could be Vince Carter. Yep. Or Tim Duncan. Uh, good question. Hmm. I'd like to be a hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an answer, Al. That... No. Who had? Well, who had the better career? I mean, Tim. Yeah, for sure. No question about it. And it's funny because, you know, who reminded me of Tim, Pete Sampras. And I remember once after Pete retired and, you know, Pete lives out here and I played a lot of golf with him through the years. And I, we were walking down the fairway at one point, a couple of years after we retired. And he was a little worried about becoming not as relevant in retirement. And I said to him, you remind me of Tim Duncan. I think you'll only be appreciated to the fullest extent after you're gone. And they were the same kind of people, right? Uh, not necessarily gregarious, obviously, or entertaining, but tremendous, tremendous. You didn't answer the question. We, you know, Al, you yeah. didn't answer the question. Vince Carter, uh, Duncan, what can I tell you? <laughs> yeah, Duncan won championships. Yeah, and all yeah. that. Vince, was, you know, Vince was great to watch. But, you know, Duncan, I mean, that's, what, what are you playing the game for? You're playing the game to win the game. And, you know, look, look at Duncan's record. Unbelievable. Great to talk to you. So, I, hopefully we yeah. didn't, uh, you know, slow down your uh, golf game today. Listen, I have to tell you one thing. The last golf tip you gave me. Johnny right, Miller. Johnny Miller. Johnny Miller. So it worked for about <laughs> three holes. But, Dan, the problem right now is when I try to put that in my head, what I do is I go, Johnny Miller. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, you Johnny slow Miller. I'm, slow yeah, down Johnny, your swing. No. Yes. Johnny, Johnny, Johnny Miller. I, I know. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Al. All right. Great yeah. to talk to you, buddy. Dan, I'll be good, Finn. That's, uh, that's Al Michaels. The great Al Michaels. Take a break. Last call for phone calls. What we learned. Also, rhyme time with Todd. We'll squeeze that in back after this.